this episode, I spoke to Professor Wiener from the University of Toronto about his book, Dangerous Minds. And in Dangerous Minds, he connect, well, he, it's kind of about two prominent philosophers, so Nietzsche and Heidegger. And it's about how their thoughts um, and writings aren't as apolitical and harmless as a lot of people think. And the, the way he kind of goes about um, demonstrating his point is he takes quotes from um, far right, modern far right thinkers, and he shows how their thoughts and ideas aren't so different from some of what Nietzsche and Heidegger write. Um, an interesting point that kind of supports his idea is that Heidegger, who came after Nietzsche and so was influenced by Nietzsche's writings, was um, involved in the Nazi movement. Um, Hitler and Mussolini were also likely influenced by Nietzsche. And by the way, he's not at all saying, you know, don't read Nietzsche or don't read Heidegger, they're all dangerous. Like, not at all, he's not saying that. He's just kind of saying that they both, those two philosophers wrote such a huge amount of works, so like books and papers, that there's something in there for everyone. You know, there's something in their books that's going to appeal to liberals. There's something in their books that's going to appeal to far-right thinkers as well. And he's also not saying, you know, their books or the their books and papers are the sole cause for um, far right thinking or other dangerous type of thinking. He's just saying, you know, they're not harmless, but they're not. You know, it's not x x cause equals y effect. You know, he's just saying when you read their books, be aware that some of what they say, you know, not all, but some of what they say, is not harmless. And so, with that, I hope you enjoyed the interview. First question is going to be, um, what are the trends in political and philosophical preferences? What influences these trends? And why um, authoritarian or Nietzsche were popular in the 1930s and 40s? And why they're becoming popular again? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> um... You know, I'm first of all, I'm not a historian, so I I wouldn't presume to give any kind of sophisticated account of the rise of fascism. Uh, I'm a political theorist. I study ideas, and uh, you know, in terms of the, the the influence of Nietzsche in particular on the rise of fascism, I, I don't think it's a question so much of the 30s and 40s. The seeds of what happened with respect to fascism in the 30s is to be located in the 1920s with something called the, the conservative revolution. People like uh, Ernst Jünger, Oswald Spengler, uh, Carl Schmitt. I mean, if you look at contemporary far-right presses, they're doing their utmost to bring those authors back into prominence. And those thinkers were thoroughly uh, Nietzschean, and insofar as Nietzsche had an impact on fascism or helped uh, to lay the groundwork for fascism, which I think in some significant measure he did, it was through those thinkers. And, um, you know, if one tries to identify a kind of core idea, I think that the, the general general idea was that you know, virile cultures have to uh, assert themselves and make a lasting impact on human history. And liberal bourgeois culture isn't equipped to do that. It, you know, it's by Nietzschean standards, degenerate and decadent, and and uh, people living within an egalitarian horizon will never produce anything grand. Uh, it will only be kind of weak and and fleeting, and ephemeral, and uh, and you know so that's you know to <laughs> the the fascists and then the Nazis tried to deliver what those thinkers wanted. Now maybe you know nobody got exactly what they wanted. You know what Nietzsche would have made of Mussolini and Hitler is is. Anyone's guess he might have been quite unhappy, and for that matter, Ernst Jünger might have been quite happy with 
unhappy with the Nazis, but still they generated a dissatisfaction with uh, liberal bourgeois civilization. And the fascists say, well, we can give you what, what you find so woefully lacking in, in liberalism and, and in Marxism. Uh, you know, that's spiritually hollow. We'll offer you something that's, that's not spiritually hollow. And, you know, I mentioned that there are these far right presses and far right websites, far right podcasts, all trying to soak up the same kind of dissatisfaction with a liberal egalitarian culture and soak up the same yearning for something radically different. And uh, I mean, I don't want to go so far as to say, well, reliving Weimar, although a lot of people I think are starting to say that, but that's, that's certainly the, the fear. So, you know, the, the relevant Nietzscheanism uh, was, was, I think, you know, made itself felt in Germany in the 1920s. And here we are 100 years later, and rather than people saying, well, <laughs> Uh, you know, look where that look what that led to. I think we're we're seeing a replication of similar similar patterns. Uh, I mean, that essay I I uh, I sent you uh, that I published in Thesis Eleven. I cite a Polish uh, politician or former politician who you know expresses scorn about you know, sandal wearing, bicycle riding vegetarians who represent the destruction of Christian civilization in Europe. Well, that's a kind of Nietzschean rhetoric, you know, it's the kind of another version of what Nietzsche called the last man, culture of the last man. And, um, and you know, with that, uh, that, that represents a path towards something radically illiberal and we're seeing more and more of that, both within kind of intellectual life, with more you know intellectuals of radical right popping up, but also in actual real political life, in 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 illiberal what you know what they call them so illiberal democracies in Hungary, for instance, or Poland, or you know also the United States, uh, unhappily. So uh, I think that's. All that speaks to the relevance of, of Nietzsche and feeds into some understanding of what it is to kind of re relive the unhappy experience of, you know, not, not maybe outright fascism, but a kind of proto fascist culture as one saw in Weimar Germany. And um, so I think that's, kind of, that's, that's roughly the story I would tell. Okay. Um, and then so the solution in your book, you present a problem and then you review the solutions that other people have given, which tend to be that you should give people philosophical training before reading Nietzsche. And then you say that that's not really effective because most of the people who do this are philosophically trained. So your solution is that you have to read the um, philosophers with um, an understanding of why they're dangerous so that you don't see them through like a misguided perspective. Can you elaborate on what you proposed? Yeah, well, first, let me clarify. I've never really seen myself as a political theorist as in the business of dishing out solutions. I mean, I think there are probably a lot of people who are in the same line of work uh, and who think that, you know, that's the business of political theory is to give us uh, solutions and to guide, you know, societies towards intellectually, you know, um, uh, appealing and appeal, uh, you know, uh, attractive solutions to existing problems. Well, I've, I've never really thought of my vocation that way, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, for me, the business of, of theory is primarily to be more reflective. And, you know, if that con contributes to good in the society, well, terrific. I mean, self-reflective society is better than an unreflective society. And one hopes that intellectuals can modestly contribute to that. But, you know, I don't see theory as kind of, you know, 
in what sense is it supposed to be the source of solutions? You know, very few people in a society are equipped to read high theory. And for most of them, it's over their heads and or they're not interested or they don't have the intellectual discipline to read very difficult books. And, you know, I spend my whole life doing that and, and, and uh, having conversations with the people who are similarly equipped and the majority of people aren't. And it's, it's, um, it's unrealistic realistic to expect that, well, you just you write a book of political theory, distribute to the masses, and then uh, problems are fixed. And I mean, the ultimate solutions have to come from the substance of civic life and people exercising their civic responsibilities. And, you know, so becoming more reflective is, is contributes, hopefully would contribute to that. But I'm not saying, well, you know, here's my solution. And then I write this book and now everything's okay. I, I just don't see that as being the a realistic view of the relationship of theory to the political life of the society. Um, but, um, you know, I wrote that book through on the basis of a sense of alarm, uh, not so much as a theorist, but as a citizen that we seem to be entering a, a new kind of zeitgeist, a whole new different kind of cultural milieu that seemed, uh, you know, dangerous. And, and uh, uh, you know, the book was a kind of cry of alarm and, and hope of warning whoever might read the book. Uh, again, I had no idea that, well, everybody's going to read this book. And 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 the, everyone would be suitably warned. I mean, it's just that's it's not how how theory works. But uh, but uh, you know, as a citizen, I felt that I had to try to contribute something to alerting people to a kind of dangerous waters that that the uh, contemporary liberal democracies were moving into. And you know, nothing that's happened since I've written the book has, um, you know, uh, ease, ease my anxieties about any of that. And I think we all, as citizens, we, we need to be, uh, you know, the, the, kind of all the red lights are flashing. We have to be on our guard again, be vigilant against threats to, to you know, sound, sound uh, safe and, uh, you know, sound and decent uh, and healthy uh, uh, civic democracy. And, uh, I think it's very much in peril right now. And the agitation by uh, right-wing or far-right intellectuals, uh, including those influenced by Nietzsche, I think are is contributing to what, what makes uh, the political life in the present so, um, so scary. Um, since we're, I mean, the, I guess the, the broader context here is uh, uh, it, it is Nietzsche and Nietzsche reception and ways in which Nietzsche um, uh, is a kind of a potentially very unhealthy influence on, on contemporary civic life. So maybe you want me to uh, kind of sketch my, 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 my core, core view of Nietzsche. Should, should I do that? Yes, please. I mean, you asked, you know, if I taught Nietzsche, uh, you know, would I preface it with a warning? Well, my, my book, most of what's in that book was a, uh, my were lectures I wrote for a grad seminar on Nietzsche. So, and it's not like I prefaced it with a warning. The whole book is a, a warning from start to finish. Every page of that book is trying to warn people about what they, you know, a, a kind of excessively benign view they might have of Nietzsche. So I obviously I want to correct that because I think Nietzsche, just as he had in Weimar Germany, had uh, intended or unintended, had had very dangerous consequences for, for political life in, in that country and in Europe and in the whole world. Well, again, insofar as we're replaying some of those patterns, Again, Nietzsche can be very uh, dangerous. So I guess I should try and 
characterize what I take Nietzsche to be about centrally. And uh, so that helped make sense of that and help make sense why Nietzsche was a, a focus in, in writing, writing this book as a response to the kind of rise of, or the return of the, the far right in contemporary politics. So, um, well, let me start with what I see as important in Nietzsche and how that morphs into something quite dangerous. So I, I would characterize Nietzsche as the inventor of the whole theoretical enterprise of uh, critique of it, critique of modernity. Uh, and that's not just what I'm calling it. He, he, he himself used that term and it became one of the most consequential themes of 20th century political philosophy. I mean, you know, you could have a whole catalog of crucial thinkers who are all participants in that enterprise, you know, whether Adorno or Alistair McIntyre or Hannah Arendt or Strauss or, or Voigtland. I mean, all of them are in their different ways um, trying to reflect critically on modernity as a way of life, as a dispensation. And I think we should do that. As I said before, it's part of our business to try to help our society and help ourselves to be self-reflective. And the world we live in is a world of modernity. So, uh, you know, being an intellectual or even being a citizen, part of the crucial part of that business is to be self-reflective of the weaknesses or limitations of what we call modernity. Well, I think Nietzsche, I don't, I, I'd be surprised if anyone used that term before Nietzsche. Uh, but, you know, if we're going to take Nietzsche seriously, we have to ask, so what did he mean by critique of modernity? And not just, you know, what, what did, a, you know, Hannah Arendt mean or Alistair McIntyre mean, but what did Nietzsche mean by critique of modernity? And I think he had a very clear understanding of it, and it has, you know, massive implications for Nietzsche reception and the possible uh, influence of Nietzsche on far right uh, thinking and far right practice. So Nietzsche, I think, would say that what decisively defines modernity is that it is a culture shaped by Christian universalism and Christian egalitarianism, the Christian commitment to all of us as uh, as uh, equal individuals, all with the right to kind of uh, uh, live uh, live out you know our lives in in ways that realize our potential, and we're all children of God, and and uh, you know we should all have our place in the sun. And well, for Nietzsche, those notions uh, are are uh, a catastrophe, and that's why his a central polemical target is Christianity because he's the source of Christianity is the source of that those egalitarian presuppositions within whose boundaries we all live, and within such a dispensation, all you can get is kind of either you know, liberalism or uh, you know socialism or whatever, and 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 that for on Nietzsche's view. That's not a real culture. That's just decadence and degeneracy. And again, that fit into the conservative revolution view that that um, um, uh, you know that that <laughs> what 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 Christianity had bequeathed to modernity was you know a culture of 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 of, de of decadence and degeneracy, and one had to destroy it. And again, fascism, the idea was that that would offer something radically different, something outside those Christian egalitarian horizons. So <clears throat> for Nietzsche, you know, um, the, the kind of thing that moderns, qua moderns believe is that, for instance, slavery is morally intolerable. Uh, they believe that uh, caste morality is intolerable. The idea of people being locked into castes uh, and there being no possible uh, class mobility. Uh, moderns, quay moderns, believe that morality is the highest standard by which to judge cultures. 
uh, they believe that everyone's life matters, not just those who are quote unquote superior. Uh, well, Nietzsche's view is that believing these kinds of things, which basically, you know, are that's what what delineates the, the the horizon we call modernity. All that's a kind of destruction of culture that you can't have real cultures if people believe those things. And he th he thinks he does have a solution. Unlike me, you know, he's it's not just uh, um. um you know, it's not just theory for the sake of reflecting and becoming more self-reflective, but, you know, similar to Marx, uh, the purpose of philosophy is to change the world. It's not just about interpreting the world, it's about changing the world, and Nietzsche had a very clear idea of how he wanted to change the world. Uh, he wanted to bring back a kind of ancien regime of some form of aristocracy headed by an iron-hard ruling caste, and this is a, a political project uh, you know, from start to finish. And, you know, there are countless readers of Nietzsche who think Nietzsche's apolitical, he's non-political, he's anti-political. Well, that's just all nonsense. Uh, how can you be screaming on every page of the, you know, your work, right? Thousands, thousands of pages screaming in there on every page that equality is evil and that we will never have a proper culture until we a jettison that idea of equality that that the Christian dispensation has given us. Uh, that is is it's utterly political, and and you know uh, I'm not saying that you know Nietzsche was hoping for Hitler or or wanted anything like that, but uh, you know I believe. Hitler did read Nietzsche. I believe he did influence Nietzsche, and I think he agreed with Nietzsche that with um, that if you live within horizon shaped by uh, by Christianity, all you will have is decadence and degeneration. You won't have real cultures, and 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 uh, and that's the basis on which Hitler was determined to destroy both liberalism and communism because they were decadent, because they were shaped by a decadent uh, Christian egalitarianism. Well, that's a Nietzschean belief. And, you know, if you look at far-right intellectuals of today, they believe the same thing. Um, you know, they're Nietzscheans in, in exactly that same sense, that Christian has to be destroyed because Christian egalitarianism and Christian universalism renders real culture impossible. I mean, that's the core far right belief that I think drives the contemporary radical right. And in that sense, it both is and understands itself to be a, a, a revival of, of, of the fascism of the 20s and 30s. Anyway, I'm going on way too long, but I'd probably answered a few of your questions all in one, but I, I'd better let you kind of get a word in edgewise there. Um, okay, yeah, I think so. my next question will be, what came first? Were Nietzsche and Heidegger products of their time or was time product of their thoughts? And is it only reading their ideas that create dangerous minds like Spencer or was Spence, or were um, these modern um, Nietzsche thinking people already thinking that before reading Nietzsche? Well, I, I think we definitely want to avoid an overly simple view of the relationship between ideas and political reality. Uh, I mean, I think it goes in both directions. I mean, to start with the idea of Nietzsche and Heidegger or any other thinker being uh, a product of their times. Well, I'm, you know, I'm just not sure what sense to make of that idea. I mean, you know, Nietzsche and Marx were both. Uh, thinkers who grew up in Germany in the middle to late 19th century, and yet they had completely antithetical uh, uh, views of the world and views of society. And so if they're both shaped by, you know, Germany in the 19th century, well, why didn't, then they should believe the same things rather than believe, believing uh, radically opposed things. So or, or, you know, today. So we all live in, in the world of 2022. And some of us, you know, believe what your average, uh, you know, 
liberal or social democrat believes and then some of us are you know trumpites who you know are yearning for autocracy or 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 uh you know yearn for uh you know orban's hungary or or putin's russia you know so there's a wide span of thought with among people who you know are shaped by the same culture and live in the same time or live for even the same time and place and yet think and believe and are committed to radically different things so one has to attribute a kind of basic autonomy to thought people think and come up with ideas and those ideas could be good or bad but they're not just a kind of spin-off from the culture in which they live otherwise everyone would believe the same thing and that's clearly not the case. You know, as for, you know, ideas shaping political reality, I mean, certainly one might be my view that, well, you know, we had fascism in the 30s because Nietzsche wrote some books and, you know, which appealed to Mussolini and Hitler, and then it's all Nietzsche's fault or some, some something like that. I mean, that, I think that would be absurd. I mean, you have to start with the material reality of those societies. I mean, the explanation of fascism was far more to, you know, post-World War I reparations and high inflation and, you know, the crisis of parliamentary democracy and a whole bunch of other things that, but, but that doesn't mean that Nietzsche had no effect. I mean, uh, would there have been a Hitler if Nietzsche had never lived or never published his books? You know, I it's it's uh, it, it's it, it's it's sort of I'm not sure it's even meaningful to ask that kind of question. But but you know, I think the the one ha, one doesn't start with you know here are these ideas and then they produce the consequences X Y and Z in in the real world. Uh, I mean, the world is the world. It's it's shaped by all kinds of things, including very much, um, you know, material causalities and so on. But, uh, uh, you know, the ideas do count for something, and and uh, people do read books and are influenced by them. And, you know, think of Rousseau, Rousseau and the French Revolution. I mean, would there not have been a French Revolution if Rousseau hadn't published the Social Contract? I I mean, I'm not sure where, when, how, when he would even go about answering that kind of question. But I mean, the reality is there was some, some kind of transformation of self-understanding after Rousseau published those books. And so, you know, I, I, I think one wants to steer away from very simple ideas that, well, you have ideas X that produce, you know, political consequences Y or a political world X that then generates ideas why. I think it's, you know, it's far more complex and multi-dimensional in, 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 in both directions. But I think there is a kind of sufficient influence of ideas on people who do read books that, uh, you know, when you're throwing very dangerous and reckless ideas out into the world, which I think Nietzsche did, um, uh, then that, is something that one should pay attention to, and and uh, uh, you know, so that's 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 I guess the relevance of my book. Not that well, let's stop reading him, or you know, Nietzsche's the to blame for everything that's uh, you know going off the rails in the contemporary world. I mean, that's not that's not my view. But uh, other things being equal, it's better to be more reflective than uh, less reflective. Better to be more vigilant. And less vigilant, and insofar as ideas are helping to shape people's thinking, you know, let's let's be uh, trying to be a little more clear-sighted about all that. And uh, that's so. I you know again, I try and you know uh, emphasize the kind of modesty of what we're what the enterprise is here. Uh, I mean, for sure, Richard Spencer still would have been the fascist he is if he hadn't taken that Nietzsche grad seminar. But he did take the Nietzsche grad seminar, and he does himself claim that it changed his life. And we have to, you know, take that with some seriousness. And uh, what does it tell us about Nietzsche? What does it tell us about people who are 
reading Nietzsche as if he's completely innocent or as if he's completely apolitical. Well, maybe we need to rethink that a little bit. And so, the, you know, my book tries to highlight some texts which should, well, you know, there are things in Nietzsche that could uh, lead a Richard Spencer to say, yeah, reading this book changed my life. I mean, that's not crazy. And, you know, he's written about Nietzsche and he writes intelligently about Nietzsche, just like, you know, Greg Johnson writes intelligently about Heidegger. They're, they, they're, you know, they're smart people, evil, maybe, uh, probably, <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, but evil people can be smart and, and thoughtful and, uh, and, and read sometimes more perceptively than people who are not evil, you know? And, uh, and what are they gonna do with those ideas? Once they've got them in their pocket, they'll run. And uh, we should be on our guard about all that. And I'm just trying to, uh, you know, uh, urge people to be vigilant. And, and we have that responsibility as, as citizens, uh, not just as intellectuals. I mean, I think there is interesting and important questions about the responsibility of intellectuals. But, you know, when I wrote that book, it was more out of a sense of, you know, my, my responsibilities as, as a citizen. I mean, my, all my other books uh, really were written as a theorist writing to other theorists. That book was more, you know, more of a citizen's book addressed to fellow citizens. And, you know, it's, I think, reflected in the reception. I mean, I wrote, I published uh, 13 books prior to that one. I haven't done a single podcast with any previous book, whereas this, I believe, is podcast number 14 related to the Dangerous Minds book. So, you know, obviously it's plugging into things that concern us as citizens. And, you know, until liberal democracy sails back into safe harbor, uh, you know, I think we have to be you know, ultra vigilant about all those things. And, you know, I'm not sure liberal democracy ever will sail back into safe harbor. I mean, we're told, you know, around 1991 by Francis Fukuyama, you know, liberal democracy had won and it would you know, last for the rest of time. And well, it, it didn't. And, and it, you know, it's looking in shakier condition than, than, than ever right now. And, uh, and, uh, you know, if, if theorists and intellectuals can contribute to greater awareness and, and you know, civic attention or civic uh, uh, attentiveness to that, then, then that's what they should do. And that's why I wrote the book. Okay. And then my final question would be, what was the response like to your book? I think you sent me some reviews from modern uh, far right thinkers what, what well yeah <laughs> uh yeah i mean you know just in terms of the general run of responses i mean people have a very passionate commitment to nietzsche he's always one tremendous following uh, especially among young people and says you know people read nietzsche and feel he's shaped you know changed their life not necessarily turn them into fascists but you know, people feel a, a deep, uh, you know, emotional commitment to Nietzsche. So I got a kind of a lot of pushback that I'm unfair to Nietzsche or I'm over politicizing him. And, you know, I stand by my readings of Nietzsche. But as for the far right, well, uh, as you know, I so the very first review of the book uh, was uh, uh, by a leading ultra figure. I mean, even calling him alt right, I think, is <laughs> overly generous. I mean, he's a Nazi, and uh, and he's got his own Nazi website, and that's where the book appeared. And you know, he kind of engaged in a bit of trolling. He he tweeted it to me, and the Beaner wants a uh, an intellectual debate with the alt right. Uh, game on, you know. <laughs> well, I'm not going to uh, get into in intellectual debates with with Nazis. I mean, he said a lot of nice things about me, he said a lot of nice things about the book. And in a lot of ways, it was a very intelligent and thoughtful uh, review because he's a smart guy. But, you know, leaving aside the 
you know, the, the, the places where he showed himself as a Nazi he is, you know, at the first line of the review. It's 5,000 words long, took him till word six to identify me as Jewish. Well, what, what, what's that about? He's, you know, saying, saying to his followers, of whom he has many, um, uh, you know, this guy's our uh, enemy. And uh, he's not just his en uh, our enemy because of his, you know, his what he thinks is an intellectual, but he's he's in our, our enemy because of what's what's in his blood. Uh, uh, because you know, being Jewish is a matter of blood, and uh, they have that, their blood, and we have our blood, and we're, so we're enemies. Well, <laughs> you know, that's the kind of thing that Nazis. That's the way Nazis think. And well, I'm not going to have an intellectual. Uh, discussion uh, as if he were just an ordinary intellectual with someone who thinks I'm his enemy because of what's flowing through my veins. I mean, that's that's just uh, evil. So yeah, it was a big shock <laughs> uh, that that should be the very first review of the book, which it was. And uh, and he sent it to me to shock me, and it you know had that that effect and you know part of the problem in writing a book like that is um you know th these guys love attention so it's it's a kind of two-edged sword to try and w w warn the world about them so as a citizen i'm trying to deliver a warning to my fellow citizens uh, in liberal democracy but at the same time i'm giving these guys the kind of attention they want and there's you know there's no way around that i mean uh, I knew when I wrote the book that, you know, that's what they love is for people, you know, the, the thing they hate most is just being ignored. And so there's a temptation of just, well, let's just say nothing about them and pretend they're not there. Well, I don't think we can do that. They are there and they're gaining more and more followers because of this thing called the internet. <laughs> so they all have uh, podcasts and they have their own publishing, you know, empires. Greg Johnson certainly does. And they use it to recruit people and they're pretty good at it. And so just to put our heads in the sand, pretend they're not there, I don't think that's viable. But so if you kind of try and say, look, there are all these radical right intellectuals and they're they're on the rise and they're they're a threat to us. And well you know, it, it, it gives them what they love, which is, which is people paying attention to them. I mean, I, you know, when I, after the review of this, I wrote a little essay for Chronicle of Higher Education, and it was reported to me that, you know, these, these radical uh, uh, right types uh, were ecstatic about it, including uh, Johnson himself. And, you know, he, he published with his own press, because he has his own press, published a book of his essays on Heidegger. And, you know, I described him as a dangerous mind, and he was very happy to use that as a blurb on the back cover of his book. And to my horror, I'm now providing blurbs to Nazis who hate me, you know. Uh, so you get into these paradoxical situations, and it's just part and parcel trying to, you know, engage with that kind of uh, ugly aspect of our contemporary world. So it's been an interesting kind of uh, roller coaster type experience for me, very different from all my previous uh, experiences as an intellectual, but uh, it's been it's been educational. Okay, well, thank you for your time. That was really interesting. Thank you. Well, thanks, thanks a lot for your interest in the book and thanks a lot for taking the trouble to do this interview. To recap, we learned a little bit more about um, how Professor Beener sees himself as a political theorist. Um, we learned about the interesting responses to his book and how he felt about those responses. We also saw that um, the sole root cause of, you know, far right thinkers and other dangerous mind is not one book. I mean, it, it is, but there are other influences as well, and you can't just blame one book for everything that happened. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. If you have any additional information or opinions on the topic, please leave it in the comments down below. As always, if you have any other ideas for what you'd want to hear about, please leave that down below as well. And thank you for watching.